We're recording and streaming, so I think we're ready when you are. I just want to welcome everybody to the uh, uh, September uh, 24th uh, meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, would you like to do roll call, Kathy? Sir. Sure. Chair Wojciechowski. Here. Vice Chair Stevens. Here. Commissioner Scott. Here. Commissioner Hammond. Present. Commissioner Routen. Here. Commissioner Bockert. Here. Commissioner Rubis. Here. Alternate Adams. Alternate Quarternick. Commissioner Liaison Broyles. Here. Council Liaison Clark. Here. Council Liaison Jelani. Here. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for uh, attending the Zoom meeting. This is way easier than trying to make it to City Hall. So uh, we have good attendance, don't we? Uh, but thanks for everybody. And, uh, and Steve can smoke while he's... Uh, That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't do that in my house. Otherwise, my, I'd be out on my ear. So, uh, so anyway, I, I'll take a motion to... Uh, um, approve the minutes from uh, August 27th. I approve. So I'm approved. I'll second. So, okay, first, who made the first? Uh, Steve seconded and uh, Jan did. Jan, yes. Okay. Uh, all in favor? A any comments on the minutes? I looked them over, they looked fine to me. Any other comments? Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. We've Thank got you. approved minutes, Kathy. Uh, public comment? Uh, any public comment? Michael, you're the only public, so any comments? <laughs> I think he's going to have plenty of comments for us in a little bit. Um, we have no attendees um, on the Zoom meeting, and we did not receive any public comments in advance. So, we can move on. so just just to be clear, if somebody, if a if uh, if a resident wants to make a comment to the commission, they would send it to you, uh, you Kathy, or you Joe, and you would let me know and read those comments. Yes, there's multiple ways they can email. There's public comment forms online that they can complete um, or they can attend the Zoom meeting and uh, raise their hand there and we'll give them the opportunity to speak. Okay, and I just want to note that Debbie uh, Quarternick just uh, popped into uh, the picture. Just uh, here. So uh, uh, we've got new business. We got uh, um, one item, well, two items ready for action, but the first is a presentation from Michael Allen from the Preserve a Preservation Resource Search Office uh, on historic landscape preservation. Uh, so I wanna welcome you, Michael. Uh, I haven't talked to you since last year when we uh, tried to go after that Frenchtown project that we were unsuccessful at, but uh, I'm happy you're here today. I know you're gonna have, you're gonna enlighten all of us. Uh, so we're, we're happy to have you here. So. I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Michael. And if you want to say a little bit about your background, that'd be great. Certainly, good to be here, Paul. And Kathy, you didn't tell me I could smoke during the meeting, but uh, next time. <laughs> Mr. Scott writes his own rules. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> but you're welcome to light up if you'd like. All right. Well, I'm indoors, so it's not going to happen. But um, yeah, for for those of you who um, uh, don't know me um, and haven't pursued work with me before. Um, I'm Michael Allen, and I've directed the Preservation Research Office, um, a historic preservation company that I founded in 2009. Uh, before that, I worked at the Landmarks Association of St. Louis uh, for four years, where I was the assistant director. Um, I have about 15 years now in historic preservation in professional practice. Uh, my office has worked in nine different states now. Um, we're listed as qualified in six of those states. Um, so we kind of get around sometimes. Most of the work lately though is in St. Louis um, and areas along the Mississippi and Illinois and Iowa. Um, a lot of the work we're doing lately involves historic tax credits, um, large and small projects tapping into state and federal historic tax credits. But uh, we've done all kinds of other uh, work, a lot of historic cultural resources surveys, uh, including work in Wildwood a few years ago. Um, 
big survey out in, in Wildwood, um, as well as the Old Pond School nomination. Since uh, 2016, I've been on the faculty in graduate architecture at Washington University, uh, where I teach courses in history and theory of architecture and landscape architecture, um, as well as historic preservation. Um, so that's another hat that's that's on my head these days. Um, and um, I think that's that's quite a bit about myself. And um, I'm happy to be here. And I think I can share my screen, right? All right. Excellent. So this evening, I'm here to talk about historic landscape preservation, um, a topic that often uh, gets short shrift in discussions about what we preserve and why we preserve things, which are usually focused on buildings uh, and monuments. Of course, we've all been reading a lot about uh, monuments and memorials in the news these days. Um, but the construction of the land itself, how, how we shape land and what cultural significance that has um, is equally important. And maybe a lot of Americans think of landscape uh, looking like this in uh, Yosemite Valley, beautiful uh, landscape painting by uh, Bierstadt. These 19th century paintings um, evoke not only um, images of the natural world, but the sublimation of this space, the, the sublime, this great quest for the truth and hidden meaning of the world that was only found in majestic rock outcroppings, sweeping skies with sunsets and big, uh, beautiful clouds, majestic oceans and uh, lakes and rivers, things that were beyond human control that were seen as veritable messages from God. Um, and that is also landscape. But landscape actually comes from European words that mean the sh to, to, that combine land and shaping. So uh, it's not what we find, it's what we find and touch that makes something a landscape. Uh, land is not soil, land is not rock. Um, the landscape is something that we um, have, have altered and manipulated either for beauty or utility. Um, J.B. Jackson is uh, one of the chief um, writers on the subject of American landscapes, and uh, I recommend uh, reading some of his writings at some point. Uh, he sort of defined our contemporary approach to understanding and preserving historic landscapes and expanded our uh, considerations beyond parks, uh, national and local, beyond cemeteries, um, beyond what I would say are largely categorized as pretty things and into realms like highway uh, strips, fast food restaurants, trailer parks, bowling alleys, the common things that have a lot of meaning and may not always be pretty, um, but uh, often uh, are the most um, patronized parts of, of landscapes. So Jackson is, is an important person, but here he offers two definitions um, that kind of are in dialogue. The first is a portion of land which the eye can comprehend at a glance. Um, that might be that Bierstadt painting, right? You, you look at that, you, you see the beauty and impressive uh, nature of Yosemite. Um, but he's then suggesting a second definition is equally valid, which is the composition of man-made spaces on the land. So it is what we can see and comprehend as, as, as a certain unit unity like a cemetery a park or a beautiful natural space but it's also to him this composition of man-made spaces and even yosemite um a lot of what we love about yosemite comes through management practices and designs of uh, frederick uh, law olmsted senior the designer of central park who began shaping uh, Yosemite after its uh, incorporation as a, as a federal property in 1864. So laying out roads and campsites and then deciding what forestry practices would keep what was naturally beautiful, uh, very, very beautiful to the, to the human eye. But then we, we have this blurred boundary between natural and artificial. Um, the landscape is the realm where what we think is natural often is something deliberately built sometimes to fool us often just to provide a very beautiful uh, view in our daily lives. So this is a, one of Olmsted's other projects that 
uh, is more of the kind of landscape that um, I'll be talking about uh, for the rest of this talk, which is um, a shaped and designed space, something that has an obvious uh, design as we see it left in this layout to tie together different parts of Buffalo. Um, but when you inhabit the parkway system, uh, you see a postcard at right, it's so pleasant and wonderful and trees are so tall and old and sturdy. Uh, many people don't question um, how or why it came there. It just seems like it must have always been, these trees must be naturally occurring. And Olmsted sort of the master of getting us to think that what we're looking at uh, is somehow eternal and natural when in fact it's artistic, deliberate and man-made. The official federal brief on uh, landscape preservation is this one. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the other National Park Service briefs on different aspects like brick memory, uh, historic bridges. This is number 36. It was written by landscape architect Charles Birnbaum in the 1990s. It's still what we're, we're following uh, today. It's guiding uh, national, uh, state, and local preservation policies. Um, and it's under the title Protecting Cultural Landscapes. So uh, Birnbaum pushes the vocabulary even further beyond nature and landscape architecture uh, to include several types of landscape. Of course, the historic design landscape, like the Gateway Arch site we see it left, this beautiful rendering um, by uh, Jay Henderson Barr, uh, showing Dan Kiley's um, alleys of trees leading up to the monument. Uh, that's the first type. Then there's the historic vernacular landscape, which could be said to be, uh, you know, the, the common buildings uh, of St. Louis uh, and make up a neighborhood like Soulard or the architecture of Wildwood itself. Wildwood has a vernacular landscape. And this kind of vernacular landscape often uh, is noted not just, just by land features, but by built features, including entire buildings. Um, then we have the historic site. Um, which in this sense is mostly like a battlefield uh, or a site of indigenous settlement like Cahokia across the river. And then we have the ethnographic landscape, uh, which is a landscape that encodes um, archaeological information or settlement information, that the, the physical space is actually um, information, literal information, not the hand of God reaching down like in that painting, um, but artifacts, burials, uh, even recorded language or drawings. Um, that's not the kind of landscape um, I'll be talking about tonight. And here's the treatments that are recommended. Um, I'm gonna talk about two landscapes that really kind of beguile these, these approaches because I think this is, in preservation, we, we, we uh, rarely do we have a uh, sort of a linear a path. We, we often as professionals are hitting um, forks in the road and we have to interpret what's the best thing to do. Uh, and these words here often mean different things to different people and different things in different contexts. So preservation is the highest treatment, which is basically retaining things as they are. Uh, rehabilitation is making something possible um, to, uh, to enhance, to uh, sustain a contemporary use, um, a repair and alteration. Um, and we have restoration, which is to go back in time to, to, to um, put things back that are missing or um, to sometimes uh, complete a detail that was never finished in the original construction. Um, and then reconstruction is this complete um, rebuilding of a lost or completely damaged site. And this largely is only recommended after natural disaster. Uh, in my field, we rarely recommend um, rebuilding entirely missing uh, features or landscapes uh, because then we have this question of authenticity um, because if something is fooling you into thinking it's the genuine article and it isn't, uh, that's frowned upon in, in preservation, that's not really preservation, um, according to professional standards. But tonight I'm talking mostly about this fine line between rehabilitation and preservation, what to keep, how to move things forward. And I want to talk about two projects that have been in the news, one national and one local. You may have uh, seen um, kerfluffle over the White House Rose Garden recently. 
uh, was heavily, heavily uh, publicized, where um, at the direction of First Lady Melania Trump, the Rose Garden was remodeled. Its appearance changing from the image it left, which reflects its design after um, a bunny uh, melon landscape designer engaged by Jacqueline Kennedy in the 1960s had created the space uh, to what's at right, which is uh, by a contemporary landscape architecture firm um, where crab apple trees have been replanted, hard paving has been put into the garden. The roses have been given a muted blue and white palette. The colorful tulips and hyacinth are now long gone. Um, this is the current appearance. You maybe have seen it. Um, there's been a lot of press conferences in the Rose Garden since indoor press conferences are inadvisable. Um, a lot of uh, President Trump's announcements about the pandemic or recent events happen right here in this space. Um, if you're not uh, familiar, right here is the Rose Garden location. I can, hope you can see my arrow between the wing where the president's executive staff work and the White House. Um, it's facing... Um, the elliptical South Lawn. Um, behind this office build, or this the small office building, by the way, is the executive office building designed by Alfred B. Mullet, the federal supervising architect in the 1870s who favored the Second Empire style. Uh, you're probably very familiar with his old post office in downtown St. Louis. Um, only three or four of his works survived from that period. This is the only other one in the Second Empire style. Um, like the post office in St. Louis. There is a customs house in Cairo, Illinois from this period that's in an Italian style. It's also worth checking out. Anyway, the Rose Garden, um, in terms of its historic precedent, you know, many people were offended that uh, Melania Trump dared to change the site, but the reality is the site has evolved and changed uh, and at least now three times different presidents uh, and first ladies have stamped their image of this space um, over somebody else's design. This is the original appearance. Um, it was a, a small lawn, um, you know, not, not uh, heavily designed. There's a drying yard uh, closest to the wing here where, uh, believe it or not, the first family's clothes would be dried on, line dried you know, before a gas dryer was installed at the White House. So a very utilitarian space that um, President Theodore Roosevelt decided to transform, melding a symmetrical um, Victorian um, flower garden approach to the general plan with landscape um, you, relying on plants that evoked the frontier uh, and reminded him of his um, glory days um, exploring the West, uh, sort of also connoting the kind of rugged nature of this country uh, in contrast to the refined classical architecture of the White House. This was completely replaced and upended by Woodrow Wilson, who preferred this, um, these tall uh, shaped hedges with this sort of very private passage between the White House to the office building. The interior of these spaces then being sort of veiled um, so that it was hard to see in and hard to see out. This would give the presidential family a space of privacy. Uh, this was the design that was largely intact until the 1960s when Jacqueline Kennedy in 1961 engaged Bunny Mellon and Perry Wheeler, another a designer, to create this more modernist garden, which got rid of the formal enclosure, um, did not um, use any kind of hardscape, but just a simple lawn girded by low boxwoods containing some of John F. Kennedy's favorite flowers, bright tulips and hyacinths. Um, and then, of course, these famous crab apple trees. It's still a very symmetrical space, so it's taking cues from the classical architecture, but its relative informality is, you know, fitting with the modernist traditions of that period. And here's an image upon completion. Some other images in recent years. Now, by 1981, um, Buddy Mellon is being in visits to the garden that the crab apple trees are shadowing the roses, and the roses are not doing well and requiring heavy amounts of fertilizers to thrive in the shade. Uh, she recommended to Nancy Reagan at the time to remove the crab apples and have them replanted on the White House grounds to allow the roses to thrive. This bit of advice was taken uh, to heart by Omi Van Sweden and Associates, the landscape architects who designed this current version 
Melania did not design this herself, although she's getting all of the, the egg in, in her face uh, for those who don't like the new plan. Um, their plan obviously uh, removed the crab apples from the rose plantings, retained the general uh, planting beds and their designs, but introduced this hardscape, making this a much more formal and classical space. Um, you can see now this garden really emphasizes the central entrance to that office building and creates a very formal enclosure for presidential press conferences. This is commensurate with Donald Trump's own architectural agenda. Uh, you may also recall uh, his attempts to create an executive order mandating classical architecture for the federal government. This is his taste. Um, the other presidents have been expressed in, in their um, incarnations of this Rose Garden. Um, the hardscape was necessitated, according to the landscape architects, by a need to make this central lawn ADA compliant. The Rose Garden was built in 1962 before the needs of disabled Americans were under consideration. So reporters and other guests in wheelchairs uh, using other um, walkers and other devices have found it extremely difficult to use the Rose Garden. And so something had to be done, right? And here's where preservation gets tricky. We have the issue of use and access in the, the, the modern era. And this is now a very heavily used space again right now, especially in the pandemic with outdoor press conferences. Um, we also have the question of, of ecology. Unlike a building, landscapes are living things generally. They're composed of parts that change, that respond to whether, uh, or like plantings are actually alive themselves. And some things just don't work over time, even though the design intent was there. And the crab apples were very harmful for the roses and other plantings. And obviously, the design has changed. The um, classical colonnade connecting the White House to this office building is on stark display, emphasizing architecture, emphasizing order and classical principles. It's not the less formal space of the Kennedys. Um, we have Barack Obama walking through it and left here. It's changed significantly, and those changes have been derided by many people who have said it looks like a tacky entrance to a country club or um, a, a luxury hotel or resort. Well, you know, in fairness to the First Lady, um, there's a lot going on in this design, questions of access, questions of ecology, and questions of the architect's own tastes, which are maybe those reflecting the president and the first lady's directives, or maybe not. Uh, the pr principles at this firm are well known for their re reverence for classicism in landscape architecture. Um, so it's unclear um, if Trump ordered this, or if they just chose, or if Trump chose them because of their predilections, um, but what we do know here is they did adhere to some elements of what we would consider historic preservation while trying to make meaningful uh, changes to allow this space to be uh, a much better one. Whether we like it aesthetically or not is not really the key question uh, for preservation. We also have the question of precedent, which is what did this garden look like historically? We now know um, from, from the slides that it's had many different looks. So the idea of an origin point is extremely difficult. Where do we pick? Uh, well, if we wanna go back to Roosevelt, we would have to reconstruct. If we wanna go back to Wilson, we'd have to reconstruct. So the safest pa path forward is rehabilitation, which is exactly what happened here. Um, you know, again, that doesn't mean it's the best design. It doesn't mean we all like it, um, but it is, within keeping uh, of, of preservation standards that are followed by the federal government. Now, the other landscape I wanna talk about is closer to home. This is the Washington University East Campus, which was no less controversial. Um, this is what it looks like today, at least uh, from the midpoint, they're still building the drive on Skinker if you've, you've been out there, but the interior of this park is um, now finished. This is a space you probably better remember um, through this ceremonial alley of trees, um, the beautiful um, and strong pin oaks that were there since uh, the turn of the 20th century. Well, here we have changes that are needed, right? Here's the original plan from Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. This alley of trees on the right, syncing up with Lindell Boulevard, Brookings Hall Tower, closing the view on Lindell. So it's in dialogue with the rest of the city. 
it's in dialogue with a generally at the time suburban landscape around here. So it's a, a site and a design that's emphasizing open space, but really key to this design is accentuating the architecture of the college. This is a grand ceremonial entrance to the academic halls and this original quadrangle. So this axis and this LA is extremely important. Of course, the 21st century brings different demands. Here's a couple images showing its evolution. Originally, there was no driveway. There were two walkways through the LAs and a center walk. This was a space of tranquility free from automobile traffic. And here's another view. In the bottom left, we see Bixby Hall, which is still there as part of the, the art and architecture campus. And then the original University Art Museum, which has now been demolished. Now, Olm Olmsted and Frederick, um, or sorry, um, James Jamison, the architect of the campus, had originally intended for a village of professors' houses to occupy the southeast corner. That was never built. Um, but this LA is specified in the original design, as is the second tree walk you see uh, here that now passes Graham Chapel to the western end of the campus that has recently been replanted. Well, the university needed space for cars and ultimately the East End for, became a giant parking lot. Uh, two roads were built between the alleys. Uh, this became a big driveway for parents week in many buses and cars during the rest of the year pickup point for field uh, trips or the city bus. Um, not exactly as ceremonial or as tranquil as the original intent. And as the campus began to use the eastern space for academic halls, uh, more of the parking disappeared, uh, but this inevitable kind of question emerged of the center LA. Uh, all this new development was encroaching upon it and the displacement of parking meant the cars would have to go somewhere. Here's a view <coughs> right before all this started. What to do? Well, the landscape architects at Sasaki and Associates were brought in to study this and they recommended concealing the parking in an underground structure to allow for the construction of several new academic halls, the planting of a new semi alley of trees leading to Brookings, and then this sort of elliptical shape, which was implied by the original plan, but here it becomes much more um, formally articulated. There's a little bit of a driveway here, but cars are kind of kept out of the center. Um, this is a concept plan. This is not the shovel ready design plan. For that, the university turned to Michael Ferguson Associates, another landscape firm. And Ferguson actually removed the stiff um, sort of rectilinear approach to the LA, called for replanting the trees, um, but put in a network of paths that were based on studying likely student pathways through the campus. So trying to study human behavior uh, and putting the paths in shapes that would lead people to where they were headed rather than forcing them to walk in straight lines or knowing they wouldn't do that, having a, a trampled landscape. Uh, Ferguson also took out this ellipse to elongate the um, LA and then put in this plaza space that's based on Italian Renaissance hardscape, which is a really kind of jarring a change. So they're really pushing past uh, standards of preservation uh, and introducing many, many new uh, elements. In the middle of all this, I just want to point out one of my uh, past colleagues, Jesse Vogler, who's no longer at the school, led a studio in which one of the trees was completely removed, the roots exposed. It's now, here I am with some of my students last fall, you can see part of that tree. It's now a nurse log. It's um, uh, will eventually return to nature, but uh, it's sheltering the growth of other uh, new plants in this um, sunken uh, garden. The Many of the other trees, um, the lumber was in excellent condition and the university had the lumber milled and some of it's returned to campus buildings as furniture. Uh, a lot of the rest of it uh, sold off and, and, and used in building projects around St. Louis. So. Um, here was a little bit of a nod to not wasting uh, ecological material. Um, whoops, I guess it's my last slide. But in the end, we have you know quite a, quite a, a radical change uh, from the original LA um, and this sort of um, formal approach. Um, the plantings uh, returning, but the the orientation of of the trees uh, uh, to to place altered. 
Uh, the, the LAs are not planted strictly uh, in straight lines with the same species as they were before. Pathways are changing. This creates, of course, uh, space to cloak that parking garage, um, but it also creates more space for students to enjoy car-free recreational areas between these academic halls. So we have the new architecture building, Weill Hall at left, these pavilions, new engineering school buildings on the right. Um, you know, this is now uh, crossing for these in uh, the campus. It's no longer a kind of dead uh, end of the, the school. Um, some of the other issues here though um, that you don't see is that the parking garage roof structure is not very porous. So the trees are living in little concrete boxes that can accommodate root growth, but they're really constrained. Uh, over the long term, we'll test and see the viability of that planting. The grass has to be watered daily or it will die because the soil isn't deep enough for tap roots to develop. So this is a very fragile landscape. Um, huge changes. Um, and some people resisted this. Some people thought the LA was sacred, um, but the university barely gave much of a thought to preserving it. It's, it's agenda for creating new academic halls. And this giant parking garage uh, was kind of set in stone by the end of the, the first decade of this uh, 21st century. And the trees that have returned, the new pin oaks have been planted in the last 18 years, they've been growing at Tyson Research Center so that when they arrived here, they weren't little tiny babies, um, but at least um, <laughs> kindergarten age. So they're a little taller and they don't look uh, quite as anemic. Uh, but this is a huge transformation. And from a preservation standpoint, um, you know, this follows none of the preservation brief standards. This wouldn't even uh, be considered rehabilitation. This is really a new design supplanting uh, the historic design. Um, whereas the Rose Garden project, I think is, it represents a careful attempt at trying to adhere to preservation uh, planning. Now, you know, you may like one more than the other um, and I'm happy to, to discuss this. Um, but I think this also shows kind of the complexity of landscape. One other thing I'll, I'll note uh, is in terms of historic preservation, in terms of the more normal landscapes you might be thinking about, uh, a design garden in a backyard of a large home or um, a, a small cemetery or a small park. Many National Register nominations and many architectural surveys do not note landscape features. If you look at historic districts around the world, around the country, and you read the descriptions, it's usually a description of buildings only. And it's very rare that anything about the landscape is mentioned, even though the shape of the land, the relationship of the house uh, to, to tree plantings, to other houses, to the street itself, those are all indelible parts of the historic built environment. Um, and um, you, about 10 years ago, I did a survey in St. Louis Place neighborhood that led to a National Register nomination. And we actually recorded uh, landscape features like walls and pathways when they were original or from the historic period. And they're actually noted, um, which is, you know, good from a heritage perspective because those things now have a little more protection. Although we know National Register isn't the ultimate, it's local designation that really counts. Um, but also when people are using tax credits, you only get the tax credits for what's recorded as historic. So if it just mentions the house and you have this beautiful retaining wall, you're not gonna get any tax credits for, for renovating it if it's not mentioned in that document. So um, that's a disincentive to doing the right thing and restoring it or, or, or repairing it, right? So um, if you see sometimes this limestone walls taken out and split face concrete put back, it's uh, even on a historic project, all, uh, sometimes it does come down to the fact that A, that's not protected, and B, there's no real financial incentive for, for keeping those features intact. So I'm a huge advocate for expanding our consciousness around preservation to think more about landscape uh, and the settings of buildings um, and how that shapes what we uh, view as our uh, common shared past. And I'm going to stop right there. Well done, Michael. Yeah, any, uh, does anybody have any, uh, you know, I personally think that rose, uh, rose garden example, 
Uh, that was pretty interesting, and they, it, I, I think they did a good job. It kind of mixed all the all the history, and uh, and and uh, I think that that was a <laughs> looked like a good project to me. Uh, Washington University is a little more stark, I, it, to me. It's that was a big change. <laughs> I tend to agree on both of those points. Um, you know. I think I think obviously the Rose Garden is very political, so <laughs> peeling back the politics and looking at the actual plan, I think, is important. Um, I, I actually think the first lady, you know, if she directed this, I don't know how involved she really was, if, but she showed good judgment because they they could have done something. They could have tore that all out and built their own garden, which is what has happened there before. It looks like it, yeah, it looks like it has been done before. So. <laughs> Because that's Including, there were some that's, big that's, changes that's from Jack, the original. Jack ripped out Woodrow Wilson's garden, and Woodrow Wilson ripped out Teddy Roosevelt's garden. <laughs> so, I, I've got a, a question: of How do we make this apply to Wildwood? Because I'm thinking, I live in a house that was built in the 1850s. I've got a brick patio outside. I don't think there was a brick patio in the 1850s. How do, I mean, we've got a lot of old houses that have been, these, their sites have been modernized or adapted to suit their, their use today. Do we try to replicate something from the past? Do we, I mean, everything that was there before is pretty much gone now. What's what's the approach? What should we encourage people to do? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, um, yeah, <laughs> personal taste is always the, the great inhibitor, um, as you know, um, and that's almost unstoppable. But I, I you know, I do think, um, obviously, the pa patios, decks or people that are want to want those things. And I think, you know, from, from a preservation standpoint, I'm not too irritated when those things appear because they, they give use in life and some personal expression to a property, but I, I'm more worried in terms of, you know, with anything that's sort of discernible from a historic period is altered. Like, um, you know, if people carve into the, the site to build a, a large garage or, or run a giant driveway, uh, where historically that was open lawn, um, th those are things that I think are, I would discourage uh, more to, to, to cut up the, the property in the setting, uh, because that's how a 19th century farmhouse starts looking like a 21st century suburban house. And again, people want it to probably, and a lot, you know, uh, Maybe it's going to be hard to talk them out of it. And, and ultimately, you can't prevent them from doing that uh, necessarily. But, um, you know, I think the relationship of the building to its site is, is important, more so than a small patio or, or, or deck on the back. Um, I hope okay. that's helpful. OK. Well, I, I this sort of ties you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The Pond, the Pond School is a good example of, you know, we just uh, uh, you know, fix the, the stones on the front and that, and that whole wall in front of the pond school. I mean, you know, if you, if that wasn't maintained and preserved, it would take, it would take a bunch out of that site. I know the back, the back end, there's been changes made back there, but sorry about that. But that, that wall is critical to the site. I agree. I'm thinking of one thing. We've got uh, this Essen log cabin that we'll be re-erecting. Now, I think my idea would be we try to replicate what's there. Now, it's and to come up with an image of what it would have been like around a uh, uh, pre-turn of the century uh, farm cabin is that and uh yet it becomes a copy it's not a farm it's 
it's not real, but it's something that people can see and see what it, it would have been like then. No, and I, I would I would agree with that personally. Um, I'm not as dismissive of reconstruction as a lot of my colleagues, <laughs> because if you're reconstructing that cabin, then to me, it, it deserves to be in a period appropriate setting. Um, and the building's already being reconstructed, if I, if I understand you correctly. So what are you going to do? Like, not reconstruct the building would be the, the choice a lot of my colleagues would say, oh, it's, it's going to be fake, you know. Um, I, I don't agree because it's still the original building, you know, even if it's in a different location. And I I have I have actually in, in Edwardsville got a train station listed in a historic district that had been relocated. It was relocated to save it from demolition. And for years it wasn't included in the district in the National Register because it had been relocated. But um, I fought it successfully and got it in there because there, you couldn't even put it back in its original location. That site doesn't exist in the same way because of road construction. <laughs> so what are you supposed to do? Condemn that structure to an eternity of not being it not historic officially? It's like, no, because <laughs> then that means it's vulnerable to, to being demolished yeah. again. <laughs> so. I think and the, the other thing, I mean, especially with that... Uh, the rose garden type of thing it has changed and everything has changed because just to take our house it was a log cabin it was built in the 1850s it's been added on to in the late 1800s it was recited probably then i mean various things have gone on when is it not historic i mean things change and it's ad adapted what do we say? Okay, when well, the last twenty years, any change or adaptation is not historical. Well, it will be in a hundred years. So, Good so I, I think and... the, the uh, rose garden, you know, it adapts to what uh, what the needs are now, and uh, I think it's, and I think it's reflective of the original design of the structure around it now. Besides how I feel about the Trumps, I I think it's a very, I like the, the Rose Guard. Mm -hmm. These are all good points. Thanks for Chris, given the back, the back view of uh, the Pond School there. <laughs> oh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> you mean the kids didn't park show the their front cars side. back there? <laughs> No cars right. in the picture. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> but I Hold do on. think the Pond School is a good example of you get the image, the, the front of that school looks like it always did. Yet the backside has the, uh, the modern additions that we have to have. We have to have parking. We have to have a playground. Things like That's that. Uh, but the fact is that the building appears from the front. They've kept the front very accurate. So I, now, that's why I think it's a good job on, on the uh, school. Well, thanks, Michael. We appreciate your, uh, you've, you've op I think you've opened up everybody's minds to, to a little different way of thinking about landscapes and how it, how it, how it works in with the historic architecture of the place. Good. I'm happy to help. <laughs> so it's good to see everyone again. Thank you, Michael. Well done again. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Well, that that was that was definitely enlightening for me. That that's just the simple engineer guy here. So uh, he th he's got me thinking about all kinds of stuff now. So hopefully that's. The same for everybody. Uh, so we've got a, the next item of, of, on our agenda. Do we want to send him a thank you letter, Joe and Kathy, mm -hmm. too? We'll take care of it. OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, the second item on their ready for action uh, item is uh, site visits in October for the 
Orville Community Marker, that bridge is open. I just rode over it last weekend, so finally. <laughs> uh, and then the, the Portner Park and then Bellevue Farms. Yes, thank you. So as Joe and I discussed um, the site visits that you just reiterated, and it will be exciting when we dedicate the Orville marker because that is the final community marker and it's been a long time coming. So it's gonna be a fun day. We thought we maybe would just take the show on the road and do all three um, when we would normally meet in October, get to see everybody in person and, and take care of all of our stuff at once and hopefully have a beautiful fall day to do it. Um, based on the time of sunset, that means we would have to start earlier. So we wanted to discuss this with you all and see if you were on board with this plan, um, so we would basically do the um, Orville Community Marker dedication. We would um, tour Partner Park and all of the um, accessory structures there that are um, of historic by age. Um, and then we would also go to Bellevue Farms and look at the work that's been um, underway down there with by the not-for-profit, the Friends of Bellevue. So, um, we guessed it would, we should probably start about 3.30. We'll have just under three hours of sunlight um, to complete that. So we just want to open it up for discussion and input and see if you all were interested. Um, the date would be October 22nd, which is our regular scheduled October meeting. I have one question to start is, uh, do we have the location of that marker on Orville selected, Joe? No, sir. Um, obviously, like in the case of kelp, we didn't have much room and we just kind of tucked it off to the side. So as we could at least have it placed there, I would never encourage anybody to spend too much time on Wild Horse Creek Road at that location. There is an opportunity over the course of the last year, I've gotten to know all three of the property owners on the east side of Orville Road by the bridge. So there's an opportunity to actually talk to them about placement. So maybe if, instead of doing the dedication, maybe the visit could be just kind of a, where do you think it's best located as the commission? So it'll be more of a, let's check out the site and see what looks best to us before they install it. I think that's a fair request on the part of the commission instead of us just looking at it from a traffic standpoint. And as I say, I, I think the three property owners uh, may be more willing to accommodate um, its placement on the opposite side of the road um, than uh, the previous. But again, we have some space along the right of way now, so we could do it there as well. Yeah, I know the, uh, the Melrose location has a little turnout. You could, you know, get off there and just uh, kind of look at it and, and the wild horse location of Kelpie that's I mean that's you know I ride past that a lot so I can get off there pretty easy on my bike and stay out of the way of cars but if you're in a car you know you, you can miss that really easy. And I guess that's what I want to try to avoid in this particular case Orville um, and as, as I say maybe instead of doing a dedication, let's go out there and see what you all think about locations. And if you find one you like that isn't necessarily in the right of way, then we could talk to the property owner and see if we could do something a little different. What are everybody's thoughts on that? Anybody, does that sound like a good idea? Well, I'm thinking that if this is a, are we talking about this next meeting all going there? And I'm wondering is, how do we get there? If we're going to be still social distancing and driving alone in cars there, how, how are we all going to gather in that location to look and talk about the site? What, what, what Joe, do you have any plan for how we get there and do this? Yes, sir. Actually, one of the property owners, Mr. Vidal Hernandez and his wife, Elizabeth, they have an area that's graveled. I think that could accommodate most of our vehicles. And I'd be more than glad to contact him and ask if that would be okay for 
whatever, 20 or 30 minutes on that particular day. So we would be off the street in an area, on, in an area that's safe to get into and out of our cars. The other two locations will have plenty of room. Right, right. Okay, I was just thinking, like I was visualizing the Wild Hearts Creek uh, Kelpie location. Yeah, the if I can avoid that, that dangerous. Yeah, very. And your po your question is very appropriate. And like I said, uh, hopefully with the cooperation of at least one or two of the neighbors, we can make this work. Very good. Thank you. So without without any objection, it sounds like this is a great idea to do uh, get out and and hopefully it'll be a nice fall day <laughs> and not snowing or something. <laughs> Although I'm going to be a grandpa close to that date, so I'm going to have to watch it. So, oh, well, good luck. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so uh, do you want to? Uh, so we'll 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 have that as our next meeting on the twenty second. And can everybody make the three three thirty time, or is there is anybody have a problem with that time? No problem. That's and one Mr. benefit of working from home. <laughs> and and Mr. Chair, if there is an issue, we can try to create a schedule. So if you can't make the three thirty, let's say at Orville will be at such and such at 4.15 or 4.30. You can catch up with us there if you'd like. So if you can't make one or two, you can certainly, if you're more than welcome to come to the third or the second and third or all. So we can be pretty accommodating on this. Okay. So uh, sounds good. So we'll get those times out uh, for the next meeting and that'll be a Finally getting out of the uh, Zoom meeting. <laughs> okay, so uh, next next item on our, we've got some old business here. Uh, um, we got a discussion. Paul, Paul. Yes, Elizabeth. Excuse me for interrupting. Um, I know where Bellevue Farms is, but I'm not sure I know where the other two locations are. Could we have some directions? written directions for those? I'll, I'll include maps, um, addresses, so you can punch them into GPS and then maps. I'll also um, just put my cell phone number out. So if, you, if you're if you late or you missed one and you're trying to catch up with where we are, you can just give me a call. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've had to do that before. <laughs> that reminds me of somebody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the Portner Park, that's, that's one I, I think I kind of know where it's at, but Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the discussion of regarding the memorial tributes uh, and responses to questions we had the last time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Historic Preservation Commission, Kathy and I have put together a memorandum for your consideration tonight that for the most part hopefully addresses the nine items that were identified by the members at the last meeting where this particular topic was discussed. And that meeting was this summer of 2020. At that meeting, the department provided you probably the first formalized approach to how a memorial tribute program would be structured, what the process would be for someone to nominate a person or persons to such and et cetera. There was a lot of good conversation that followed after the presentation of what I would call the draft. And again, out of that came the nine items that are identified at the bottom of page one of the memorandum. What Kathy and I did next is we went through those nine items thoroughly, uh, looking at what the intent was by their suggestion from the commission and then kind of put it to, into the table, so to speak, relative to the, the, the tribute program. Along with that, at the bottom of page three and carrying over to page four, the department then kind of described what we did and why we did it 
or in some instances, why we thought it was already covered. And I think overarching out of the nine uh, comments that came from the commission, I think the commission members wanted more flexibility when an application is submitted. Meaning instead of saying the application must have red ink, must be in cursive writing and have a $5 bill with it. And I'm using those as specific examples. We wanted to basically say, submit the application. We'll look at the general core requirements that we have as part of each category, but we really want to kind of discuss it, talk about it, and even maybe have that person come in and um, do a little interview or whatever the situation might be. So I think overarching, that's what you'll see in there that there is more flexibility and it now also addresses youth and children that may uh, take, an, take an initiative and do a preservation project no one might expect. This could be anybody from, a, a, let's say a grade school age child to a senior in high school or a college student. And so that was clear from the commission. We wanted to expand the reach, not just have a bunch of old people like me, maybe being the one that's always being nominated, so to speak. And so I won't go through each of the explanations, but I will say that we felt clearly that you wanted flexibility in how you manage this process. And then different than the original draft, the department kind of went through um, this steps. So they're numbered one through seven. There's probably a lot of sub steps that I didn't include, but certainly here's what the process would look like. And highlighted in red is an item two is I think again, that overarching concern that basically says, you know, we wanna make sure that we're focusing on the impacts and contributions to the advancement of the city's goals set forth in the histor for historic preservation. And so again, we'd like to think we've collectively, Kathy and I addressed your concerns. If we haven't, we apologize, but that's what we're here for tonight to take feedback and make it better and ultimately get it to the point where it's acceptable to the commission for adoption. And then we can start promoting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Any uh, questions, comments, observations, uh, Teresa? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I I looked at this very carefully, and um, it's a, a great a great um, document. We and I I'm appreciate all of the time that you spent putting all of our ideas in from the last time. Um, I, I do see that it focuses on, the criteria focuses on the achievements, the um, uh, contributions that a person that we're looking at for these awards um, would, would, be, uh, would have offered the city. But um, whatever we do, we, we have to try to avoid offense to, or a disadvantage to any member of any particular group of society, of course. And um, if we're looking to put these names out for public viewing on um, the bricks or for, uh, on tree plaques or different things, I think because currently there are people who are appalled by certain statues, names of places, sports teams names, et cetera. And, um, and all of that is based on um, history and the surroundings of history and the um, maybe defenders of or actuators of certain political or cultural yeah. action. Um, I, I wouldn't want to dismantle any of this that's that's been done, but to to look at maybe a criteria that we have, like you were talking about, an interview, um, interview of other people, or just without looking like it's. I'm not sure how how this would look, but to not look like we're saying, "Are you good enough?" 
or what's in your background, but really to have some kind of vetting process so that we don't put something out there that's going to be uh, offensive or find something in the, in the background or actions of a person later on that would cause the city's reputation to be in question. Just a comment. Well, Mr. Chair, I think it's uh, a very timely comment. And with the permission of the commission, Kathy and I can kind of talk it through, maybe contact St. Louis County, which has a, a very rigorous historic preservation component. Um, maybe talk to them and see how they do these things. You can maybe get a little more background. So whatever we do, we, we don't have an issue arise from a program that we're hoping is something very pleasant and enjoyable and people will appreciate over the years as we move forward. So does, thanks, thanks, Kathy. So does the county have a, a program like this? I don't know, but as you know, Esley Hamilton used to be the county's historian he ultimately retired, but they finally have replaced Esley with another person. And um, from what I have heard from Tom Ott, the director of the County Department of Parks and Recreation, it was a, it was a very good hire. So I was thinking of contacting that person and just see it because I'm thinking they may have um, a lot of connections with other communities and know what they do. And then certainly Kathy has um, got a good rapport with the the representative at the State Historic Preservation Office. So we'll contact them as well. Yeah, so, I, so yeah, uh, you know, Ter Teresa makes uh, some good points as far as this day and age, uh, you know, we're, we're giving uh, recognition to individuals and sometimes uh, things happen and uh, uh, we, don't want, we don't want the city to look bad with a memorial tribute if something happens with a certain individual that's that a tribute's been made to, um, so it, it, if you can check it, check with them, Joe, uh, that'll give us some a little more information. Uh, but then at some point we're going to have to decide if we want to do this or not. <laughs> uh, and I know it's going to be scrutinized uh, as far as any 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 proposed uh, memorials. So. Uh, it's not, it's going to be an ex exclusive recognition. That's what we're trying to make it. So, uh, uh, you know, the process, I think we may want to go through the process again, Joe, as far as how this is going to operate and how we're going to pick uh, individuals for recognition. So I think we got to familiarize ourselves with that because this has been going on for, we've been talking about this for a while. So I think we may need to go through that process once again, just to make sure that everybody understands, you know, the process that we're going to go through to select those for recognition. For the newer members, maybe just a brief comment. Um, the, the discussion on my memorial tribute started with the untimely death of Lisa Kelp. Lisa Kelp was Tom Kelp's um, wife. The Kelp family had been out in this area for generations. Um, and Lisa had almost single-handedly kind of mended the bridges between the Wildwood Historical Society and the city's Historic Preservation Commission, which had struggled at times uh, in terms of a relationship. When we were talking about Ms. Kelp, it became pretty obvious Someone said, well, why are we always honoring or remembering people that have passed? Why can't we do it for people while they're alive so they can have the benefit of knowing I did a good job and people recognized it and that's kind of nice. And so that's the genesis of the program. So let's, uh, let's uh, come back with some information, Joe, from the county and see what they say. And then we'll just, we'll discuss this again. And I know you're looking to act on this tonight, but uh, let's, uh, well, we won't do it in, in October. So we're not going to have a December. So it'll have to be November, right? That we'll bring this back. I think that's perfect. Starting, you know, we'll have the Memorial Tribute Program, hopefully in place for the start of a new year. 
and hopefully one better than 2020, at least when it comes to pandemics and everything else. Yeah, so everybody be thinking about this uh, because Teresa brought up some good, good thoughts on this and, and things that we should consider before we act on this. And if there's any other comments, please send them to Kathy and I. Um, we can do that research as well. Um, but again, I just want to emphasize that I like to think that we've captured that ability of the commission to basically say, you may not have eight years, you've got seven, but by golly, those seven years were just quality years and you did a great job, you know, that kind of thing. I've got one question before we yes, go. Um, we'll be putting these things on trees and pavers or things in city property. Will we be getting in competition are upsetting other units of the government, such as the Planning and Zoning Commission, who may want to honor somebody who has done much for the planning of the city, or the city council, who will want to honor somebody from their side. Uh, we're the only group that's, I think, talking about this. What? How, how will we get along with the rest of the city? Well, again, another very good question. I guess the reason I feel comfortable, even if that question were to be raised by city council or the planning and zoning commission is, as you know, historic preservation isn't easy. If somebody buys a property that has a historic structure or building on it, nine times out of 10, and maybe even more, it's easier to tear it down and start new. So when people basically preserve something, they're going well beyond their normal duties, their normal obligation. They are really taking on a community uh, approach. And I think that's why this is be a good place to start for a memorial tribute program. And maybe it becomes the template for others in the city. I got some nice little plaques from my being on the council and the planning and zoning commission that I'm pretty proud of that are right back here. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, uh, but point well taken, Steve. <laughs> uh, so okay. So uh, any any other comments? I'm looking for uh, faces to light up <laughs> or green to go around your face. <laughs> okay. So our we'll next have, item is the work we'll, program. We'll have something back in November. Thank you. So now a presentation on the work program status. Thank you, sir. And just so there's no confusion, we actually do not meet in November. We meet December 3rd. So, because we coincide with Thanksgiving, which none of my in-laws are watching this. So I can say that maybe we should just meet on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So we will not meet then and then um, we will meet December 3rd and then we don't meet again at the end of the year. So we just combine those two into that one meeting. November, December meeting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so thank you. The update on the work program, um, we're making great progress. We have only three of our 15 items that are we haven't started at all. So of the 12 that are underway, I'm just going to give you a little update on things that have changed since last month. Um, the, uh, relative to the historical survey and inventory update, we do have a contract in place with Landmarks Association for that work. Um, the contract will go to the end of the year, so you will likely not see that item back until the January 2021 meeting. Um, they want to wait and make sure all of the leaves are off the trees so that the photographs that they take of the structures, um, that there's a a good clear view. So, but they have started and our uh, work is underway on that item. Um, the historic Route 66 Roadside Park, the RFP will be uh, put out within the next week or two on that. And I actually already had some interest from a planning and design firm this week. So the word is on the street, even though uh, we haven't issued it yet. So hopefully we'll get some great responses to that. Uh, Kathy, um, yes. could I just interrupt? You may ask, well, we had a meeting in August. 
The RFP was approved by the commission at that time. Anything that's approved by the commission, I forward to the city council so they can receive and file it. And if they have any additions or comments, I always like to give the elected body the opportunity. So that occurred just, I guess, a week, a couple of weeks ago. That's why it's uh, now September and it's still not out, but we are, as Kathy said, um, going to have it out in the next week or so. Thank you. Um, and then relative to the four ongoing items, which are uh, public relations, social media, uh, training in our city projects. If you all should have received your Gazette or if you haven't received it yet, it'll be in your mailbox in the next couple of days. You'll notice there's an article on the history book and we've told people to um, provide their email address if they want to be notified. And I'm getting a steady um, influx of emails for people who want on that list. So it's exciting, kind of building some excitement for the book to come out in 2021. Um, we, on a regular basis, not too frequent, but on a regular basis, we do post on social media um, regarding uh, historic preservation and the efforts that you all do. Over the last couple of months, we've posted something on Log Cabin Day about the S and Log Cabin. Um, we posted uh, the training from Ms. Fox last month and then Mr. Allen this month as well. Um, and Ms. the training last month with Ms. Fox just got a lot of legs under it, so to speak, a lot of reach um, on social media. And there was a large number of people that watched not only on the Zoom call, but on our YouTube channel. So that one was very well received. Um, we are shooting for a fourth training. I've reached out to the Missouri Route 66 Association and hope to have a representative from that organization at the December meeting. Um, and then uh, relative to city projects, Manchester Road, our um, streetscape project that's underway on the Mother Road is um, getting closer. It still is a little rough out there, but uh, that project is, it's a big one and is, uh, should, be, should be done this fall. So. I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding anything. I was quiz quizzing uh, Mr. Brown about when paving will occur. So <laughs> soon, he said, soon. Yeah, it's there's been some issues with the 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 lip that's from the with the lack of pavement. So yeah, there's a lot of people who are ready for that to get complete. So, so hopefully, with the Route 66 Association, will have some ideas for us for that for that task in here. So I know. Uh, We've talked about that in the past, but hopefully it'll be something we can really uh, jumpstart in the in the spring of next year. Per budget allowing, right, Joe? Well, um, we are preparing our budgets for the upcoming fiscal year, and I have uh, included the Route 66 Roadside Park as part of the planning budget under contractual services. So if we do get a good response to the request for qualifications. Um, and then the commission finds a firm that they like, then we'll do the negotiation and hopefully move forward. But that's, think that's, but that's separate from, we got two items for Route 66 on our work uh, item. So that was one. And then the other one is, uh, is the uh, program steps for promoting the route. Yeah, and I think regardless of budget, we can make a, a pretty strong headway into that next year. Uh, you know, there's a number of our work program items that have been on the work program for a couple of years, and they were nearing completion. That's the community marker program, um, the inventory update, which we won't have to complete again until 2023. Um, so there's a number of things that will be complete, and we can kind of switch our focus and efforts maybe a little more into the Route 66 project. Any other comments from anybody? That I think that that uh, kind of concludes every everything on our agenda. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would just like to ask if anyone else attended the Missouri Humanities Council workshops on September third. Besides myself, was there anyone else that? was able to do that. Mr. Chair, may I just highlight um, what I what I did very, very briefly? Sure. Um, it was on Zoom and um, 
I'm giving Kathy uh, two of the three workshop um, PowerPoints that I printed off from um, the speakers who, who made those available. Um, and I would just like to highlight and thank um, the department for uh, giving me this information because it was, it was outstanding, these uh, speakers. Um, the first one was um, on oral histories. Um, that was the first one and they lasted for, what was it, an hour and a half maybe? Um, and it was an all day thing. So you had some time in between, but that was quite interesting from um, Sean Roast uh, was his name. And the second one was on um, advocacy for historic preservation statewide and your own community, which would be Wildwood for us or your hometown if you happen to come from a place in Missouri. And the last one was um, um, the workshop on uh, historic preservation strategies in rural communities. Um, and that was a little more um, about how to set something up in, in smaller communities. And I, I found it very advantageous and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to, uh, to attend those. So thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the oral histories would have been something I, because I, I still need to interview my, my uh, uh, sister's mother-in-law because <laughs> uh, she was, uh, uh, she's a Pendleton and a partner. So uh, I got to get, I got to interview her soon. That, so do they give tips on how to interview, do an oral history with somebody? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this guy was outstanding and he gave a lot of, um, he, I, he gave a lot of uh, personal um, anecdotes about what happened to him and all the people that he has interviewed. And what brought this particular one to mind for me is that I interviewed my, if I may take a moment, um, I interviewed my father-in-law who spent two and a half years in the South Pacific during World War II. And we ran across not, this was when he was living of course, and we ran across a three by five little, um, um, little booklet that he kept. And he wasn't supposed to keep these because if the, if the enemy got a hold of them, they could use them um, for detriment to um, the, our, our servicemen and women. And I interviewed him four different times. Um, and the reason that inspired me to do that is that um, the, um, it, was, it was the History, History uh, Museum uh, and Society in St. Louis that were asking for all kinds of interviews. And uh, I did it on a video, not an, an uh, I did it on an audio, not a video. And um, it, was, it was really interesting to be able to watch him go through that little handbook that he had. It was, he could have put it in his pocket for the time that he was there. And for him to reminisce over those years, um, he passed away in, in 2004. And uh, I was able to complete it and turn it in. And um, it was quite a project, but I learned a lot and, and when I, when I went through this workshop, I said, well, I did that. I did that pretty well, even though I didn't know all the things that this gentleman was talking about at the time. Um, so it, it, was, it was enlightening for me to, um, to do that for my father-in-law. And, um, and I sat very close to him because I held a hand um, recorder in my hand while I interviewed him. And I tried to let him reminisce and go over that as opposed to asking too many questions. Um, but when we were finished, um, his first name was Art. And he, he said to me, he said, um, he said, Elizabeth, he said, thank you for championing my cause. And it was, I think he enjoyed going back and reminiscing about things like that. Hey, uh, Kathy, can you 
can you uh, make the, the copies of that presentation, even if it's just, a, can you make that available to us? I have it here. Okay. And I'm going to give these, I made a copy for her to give to anyone that wants it. Thank you. I'll pass it on when I get it. Okay. Thanks a lot. Well, I'll take a motion to adjourn from somebody. I so move. Michael and then Jan, uh, all in favor to adjourn? Aye. 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 Okay. We'll Aye. see you out in the field on the 22nd. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.